The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. The Messiah. We continue talking about Him. Most wonderful person who ever lived. And our theme this time is Resurrected Lord. He is a resurrected Savior. No matter what time of the year you talk about it, whether it's Resurrection Day Easter or whether it's July, whether it's Christmas, whether it's New Year, whatever time you want to talk about it, it always fits because it's the resurrection that is the basis of our Christian faith. Bible focus, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. I was not there to see him rise. I was not there to see the empty tomb. Perhaps some of you have been to the Holy Land and you have seen the empty tomb. But all of us are witnesses today that he is a risen Lord. If you have him in your heart and life, you are a witness. This same Jesus has God raised up. How do you know? You didn't see it. You were not there. We are all witnesses. The apostles were eyewitnesses. And we are heart witnesses. Because Jesus lives in our heart, God raised him from the dead. And we know in Acts 2.32, that's our Bible focus verse, we know because of that verse that he is a risen Savior and Lord. Christ crucified and resurrected. Peter begins to preach this same man who denied the Lord said, I don't know him. He cursed and swore, swore that he didn't know Christ. Now, after the day of Pentecost, after the baptism of the Holy Ghost, can't deny it anymore. He knows who Jesus is. He knew the Lord. He repented. He got right with the Lord. And now he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Holy Spirit's been poured out. Men and women are hearing the Word of God. They're wondering, what in the world is this all about? Is it a strange language? A bird? Is it an airplane? Is it Superman? No, it's not any of that. It's a resurrected Lord. He's risen in power and glory, and that's the reason that the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, I will send you this Comforter, and He'll come, that He may abide with you forever. It is necessary, highly expedient, that I go away. If I go not away, the Spirit will not come, but if I depart, I will send Him to you. When He has come, He will prove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convince them, sin because they do not believe on me, and righteousness because I go to my Father, you see me no more. Judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And Jesus did go back to heaven, and some ten days later the Holy Ghost came in power and glory, baptizing believers in the mighty power of the Holy Ghost. They spoke with tongues and magnified God, and that upper room couldn't keep them any longer. They busted out of that upper room and went into the streets, spreading the gospel. Peter preaches, and he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. This is the one who you have witnessed, the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. This is the one who God approved among you. God proved and approved of his son by the signs, wonders, and miracles that he did in the midst of the people. And Peter says, you know this. You cannot deny it. You yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. We've talked about this verse before, but it refers to God's doings and our doings. Our doings, we're the ones who took him. We may not have been the actual people who took him, but we are just as responsible for putting him on the old rugged cross. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. God's part, he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew what we would do. 
And he had a plan in place whereby we could be saved. Even though we put him on the cross, he was there because of our offenses, and God raised him again for our justification. Glory be unto his holy name. Amazing how you begin to talk about the Word of God. You don't have to have loud music. You don't have to have flags flying. You don't have to have whistles blowing. And all that's okay with me. Any way you want to express your worship to God is fine with me. But you don't have to have any of that. You talk about the Word of God. And the Holy Ghost begins to move among God's people. He begins to stir in your heart as you talk about the Word of God. You talk about a resurrected Lord. And we know that He's risen. Because if He were not risen, you wouldn't feel in your heart what you feel and know when somebody begins to preach and teach God's Word. Oh, hallelujah. You would not begin to feel in your heart when somebody sings about a risen Lord. And it does something in your heart and your life. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding a bit. When Peter preached this, he preached it a little more forcibly than I'm teaching it today. He preached it with power and glory. And I trust that God will have us under this same power and glory as we've talked about with the Word of God stirring in your heart in your life. Peter preached the Word of God. And he preached it forcefully. God has raised him up, having loosed the pains of death. Jesus hurt. He suffered agony in his body. He had pains. There's pains involved in death. Somebody tells you death doesn't hurt. Yes, it does hurt. It hurts for just a little bit. But the eternal glory does not even compare with the little sting of death. And you pass from this life and you go into the presence of God. The pains of death were there. They were very real to him. Psalmist in the Old Testament said, The pains of death came upon me, and hell got hold of me, but you delivered me. God has loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Death came upon him for a little while, but it didn't keep him down. Death was like a move that was got you hold. Gets you for a little bit, but it can't keep you down. That's just like what happened to our wonderful Lord. He died and he stayed in the grave. Three days. Thank God he rose again. Because it was not possible that he should be holding of death. He tasted death for every man, but death couldn't keep him down. The grave couldn't hold him. Greater is he than the grave. He's greater than death. He's greater than all these things. Christ's resurrection, not only was he resurrected, but it was foretold. And we have again these comparison scriptures, Acts chapter 2, the Gospels and the Psalms, that all tells us about our resurrected wonderful Lord. David spake concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. When we get up every day, what do we see? Besides our husband, our wife, our children, our grandchildren, people that are in the house, perhaps the dog or the cat, what do we see? Besides the newspaper, or the television, or the internet. We should see the Lord always before our face. We should wake up every day. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Son. Good morning, Holy Ghost. How different it would be if we would be like the psalmist. And he said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is before our face. It's not just enough to say, oh, God is everywhere. Just acknowledge an omnipresent God and wonderful that is. But we are to see the Lord always before our face. We don't see him physically. The psalmist didn't see him physically, but he knew that God was there. 
Whichever way you turn your face, God is there. God doesn't have to run after your face. Whichever way you turn your face, God is there. And I foresaw the Lord always before my face. When I turn my face, instead of seeing trouble to the left and trouble to the right, I always foresaw the Lord before my face. And He is on my right hand that I should not be moved. We have left-handed people. Most people are right-handed. And that right hand is your strongest hand. And you better know that He is on your right hand. You trust in Him more than you trust in your strength, more than you trust in your courage, more than you trust in anything that you have in this life that we're trusting in God. He is on my right hand, and I shall not be moved. And the song said, I'm like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. This is explaining what was going on. What in the world is all this about? These people are talking in languages. We understand it. We were born in these native tongues. And now these Galileans, these people are speaking in our language. How in the world? What's going on? And he's preaching about David, who they all familiar with. And he's quoting from the psalm, Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We can talk about the scholars telling us that this compartment was there before the resurrection of Christ, and in one place the wicked dead went, in the other place the righteous dead went, and she old, some people calling it hell, some people calling it the grave, but the Bible says hell, and we need to leave it at that. You will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And David spoke of this in the psalm, and we'll read the psalm as well as Acts chapter 2, and it tells us again, it gives you some fortification. It tells you that the same word that was spoken in the Old Testament was... Reconfirmed in the New Testament. God's Word is still true. And you have proof to tell you, not that we need proof, but it sure does help us to know that there's a lot of rubber on those tires and you're not riding on the inner tube. You're riding on a thick track tire. And that's the way the Word of God is. It has all the proof that you need. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption God didn't suffer Christ to see corruption. He raised him from the dead. Praise God. And he is alive forevermore. Thou hast made me to know the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And again, he's talking about way back yonder. He was referring up to the resurrection of Christ. Even though the psalmist is talking about in his own Particular situation right there at hand. You will make me to know the ways of life. You will fill me with joy with your countenance and your presence. But it looks forward and goes forward in time to the resurrection of Christ. You will make me to know the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. There again, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. His countenance is before your face, is shining on your face, you'll make me full of joy with your countenance. His countenance, and the Bible talks about the health of thy countenance. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted and disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him who is the health of my countenance and my God. God is the health of our countenance. As we look upon Him, as we gaze upon Him, it brings health to our physical being. It brings health to our spiritual being. It just makes us healthier by gazing upon the Lord, by living for the Lord. And then he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now when you speak of David... You're talking about someone that they revered and we revere as a holy man of God. So you didn't want to say anything about David, just frivolous talking. 
And you don't want to make fun of David. You don't want to put him down in any way. So Peter says, I want to speak to you freely about the patriarch David. He calls him a patriarch. That is an honorable title to be given, to be called a patriarch. To be called a patriarch would be even better than being called a king. You're called a patriarch. It's an old servant of God. Those who would stand in the old time way and live for God in ages past. And David is called here a patriarch. I want to speak to you freely about him that he's both buried and dead and his grave is with us even to this day. So the scripture, even though it was given to David, given through David, is not referring just to David. It's referring to the son of David. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh... He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. That's what happened. Through David's line, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Christ, when he came into the world, the angel told Mary, he will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He was born king. He was given the throne of his father David. But he couldn't sit on David's throne, still dead in the grave. He had to die for our sins. But he could not inherit David's throne. He couldn't sit on David's throne, dead in the grave. Neither could he save you and I, dead in the grave. He couldn't forgive sins if he were still dead in the grave. He couldn't justify, he couldn't sanctify, he couldn't baptize, he couldn't heal, he couldn't do all the things that he does now if he were still dead in the grave. So God raised him up to sit on David's throne. He, referring to David, knowing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. God raised him from the dead before his flesh saw corruption. His flesh saw no corruption because God raised him from the dead in power and glory. Praise be unto his holy name. His soul was not left in hell. He suffered our hell for us. He took our hell upon himself, but he was not left there. He was raised in power and glory. And David, the scripture says here, knowing this beforehand, he knew it in the sense that it was revealed to him. He didn't know it by his own knowledge. He knew it. God had revealed it to him. And then Psalms, again, telling us the same thing. Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. See how the same thing is said in Psalms 16, as it was said in Acts chapter 2. Not because God's a broken record, and He likes to repeat Himself, but He does not mind repeating Himself because He knows we get a little older and we need to hear it more than one time. But that's not the only reason. He repeats Himself, and the more important reason than that is because it shows that it's fulfilling of God's Word. Same thing it said in Psalm 16 is said, In Acts chapter 2, I saw the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. Here it says glory, and in the New Testament, Peter interprets it as the tongue, to refer to the situation there at hand. It's all right to use God's Word to refer to the situation at hand, as long as you do not do disservice to the scripture my glory rejoices we have no glory except the glory of the God of Israel upon us my flesh also shall rest in hope now not only did Christ raise from the grave but that gives us hope that our flesh will also rest in hope we have the promise of being resurrected thou wilt not leave my soul in hell Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, the ways of life. 
the path of life. The wonderful thing that happens when you get saved is that God shows you the path of life. You thought you were living before, but now you know what living's all about. You never really start living until you live for Jesus. When you live for the Lord, He shows you the path of life. He shows you what life is all about. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And there's no joy like the joy of the salvation of the Lord. And that's why when David sinned against God, and he was getting right with God, one of the first things he asked the Lord, he said, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. What good is salvation if you feel like you got a stick stuck up you know where? I mean, what good is salvation if you never have any joy? Sometimes you tell people, I know what your favorite soft drink is. And they'll say, what? And you say, 7-Up, because you got 7-Up, stuck up. 7-Up. But that's not our favorite drink. Our favorite drink is a drink of the water of life, joy of His salvation. And we need to have joy in our salvation. Because if you don't have joy in your salvation, you're just enduring it. If you have the joy of salvation, you're more than enduring it. You're enjoying it. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We have pleasures beyond measure. Not just in this life. Just think about when you get to heaven, you have pleasure beyond measure. You have pleasures forevermore. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And he has promised that to us. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah to his wonderful name. He's given us, already given us heaven. And we think about heaven, gates of pearl, streets of gold, walls of jasper, mansions, and the tree of life, and all of our loved ones will be there. And especially Jesus, the one who loved us and died for us, God the Father, we'll worship and fellowship forever. And in beholding the face of our Lord, enjoying heaven, it'll be worth it all when we get to heaven. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. What is at his right hand? His right hand, the Father's right hand, is Jesus. And so if Jesus is at the Father's right hand, then that's the pleasures that he's talking about. All of our pleasure, all of our joy, it's wrapped up in Jesus. He is a reason for our salvation. He's a reason for our joy. Not only was his resurrection foretold, but his ascension was foretold in the Psalms as well. We've talked about this verse a lot. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This verse is quoted probably in the New Testament as much as any from the Old Testament because it is telling us again, giving us that reassurance and that fortification that strength to know that God is confirming His Word. And He tells us here, as we know it, God the Father, the Lord, said unto our Lord, My Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We have a choice. We want to get saved and get right with God. Come to Jesus and believe what He told us in His Word. Receive Him in our heart and be saved or else reject Him. He's waiting there to save you. He's done everything that He can. He died on the cross for us. He paid the price for our redemption. He took our sin, our sickness, and everything upon Him. He rose from the grave in power and glory. He went back to the Father, and He's there waiting to save us. And if we refuse to be saved, He's waiting to judge us. Waiting till your enemies become your footstool. Mark chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? And that's what their answer was. Whose son is Christ? Where did he come from? They said he's the son of David. And Jesus said, How do the scribes say that he's the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? In other words, if David called him Lord, how in the world can he be his son if he's called him Lord? They could not answer. You and I can answer. How did David call him Lord? Because it's a spiritual thing. David looked forward to the Christ, and he said, The Lord, God the Father, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus' question to them was, If David by the Holy Ghost calls him Lord, how in the world can he be his son? It takes spiritual understanding to understand the things of God. And you have spiritual understanding because you're spiritual sons and daughters. You can understand the Bible. You can understand God's Word. You know how it happens. You know in your own heart. You may not can articulate it. And that's the challenge that we have that's so hard to put it out in words. God the Holy Spirit has to help us. He's our teacher, by the way, and He's our preacher. And if He does not teach us and preach to us, it will not get teached and preached. <laughs> He has to be our teacher. Acts 2.32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. The same one that David called Lord is the same one that God raised in power and glory. Hallelujah to His wonderful name. And God raised Him up. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The one that you crucified and let all the house of Israel know. And this is what they need to know now. They need to know that Yeshua has already come. They need to know that the Messiah has already come. They need to know that he's not coming the first time. He's already come the first time. And when he comes again, he's not coming the first time. He has already come the first time. And if they're waiting for him to come the first time, the second time, when he comes the second time, it'll be too late. they got to get right with God now, and they can get right with God now individually. He's not dealing with them as a nation per se now, but he's dealing with them individually, and they can get right with God. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Can you imagine being there and hearing Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, preaching about this risen Lord, letting all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised him from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ, the anointed one. They were pricked in their heart and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is to you, to your children, to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. The promise is there for us, and the promise of the Holy Ghost, the promise of God's salvation, is real, is wonderful, and Jesus The same one who rose again in power and glory will come again in power and glory to judge the world and to set up his kingdom, to rule forever and ever. What a wonderful time it'll be. He'll fix everything that's wrong and make it right. He'll put this world the way that God meant for it to be, and we'll never have any more trouble. Everything will be right because Jesus will be head of it all, and we'll be with him. Glorified, just like he is right now. We'll be glorified in a glorified body. We'll be with the Lord. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's the New Testament, whether it's Psalms, Acts, Gospel, whatever it is, all your word is powerful, rich and powerful, and it's inspired and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to do what you need for it to do. And I pray, Lord, that you would do mighty things in our heart and our life with this word. May this word reach the nations of the world. And may people come and be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.